Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Carlin. I'm your host for Hey Doc, What's New in Plant-Based Medicine? And I'm so excited to have Dr. Christy Funk here. I'm going to bring her on screen. She's backstage electronically, but I wanted to have, she when she wrote her book, she, um, uh, as a breast cancer surgeon, breast the owner's manual. She was on most of the, the talk shows, the morning talk shows and the afternoon talk shows. And we have a video that actually introduces her. So I'm going to let the talk show host introduce her and then we'll bring her on. Please welcome, I love her name too, Dr. Christy Funk. Founder of the Pink Lotus Breast Center, Dr. Christy Funk. So Dr. Funk, you say you have some, some rules for weight loss. What's number one? Dr. Christy Funk has dedicated her entire career to preventing and treating breast cancer. And today, the doctor who helped save Angelina Jolie's life is teaming up with another champion in the fight against the disease. You get all this confusing, contradictory misinformation, and you don't know the source half right. the time. We've been told over the years that if you're on birth control, your chance of getting breast cancer increase. Is that true? Coffee. What about coffee? What about soy? What okay. about alcohol? Unbelievable. But very helpful. Thank you so Thank much. You. That was great. I've actually mm. created the Cancer Kicking Summit. You can visit online video or in person in California to talk about what you can do to control this disease. Yes, I love hearing that. Please welcome, I love her name. I hit the wrong one. There we go. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Lisa. So great that you could join us again. Thanks and, for having me back. Uh, yes, well, you're, this information is just so incredibly important, and I want so many women to see it. So we are now live on Facebook, my Facebook, Jane Glass Mitchell's Facebook. We're also live on YouTube at JVM, and we're live on Twitter. So we're broadcasting all over the place. And Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is sharing the post. So I'm really excited about that. So I always start off my show by saying, hey, Doc. What's new in plant-based medicine? Hey, Lisa, what's new is that plants are the best way to combat COVID and breast cancer. It's a twofer. So turns out COVID um, has really made a surprising impact on breast cancer. Screening is down 61% compared to pre-COVID numbers and genetics consults down 26%, breast surgery down 20%. And you ready for this? Breast cancer diagnoses are down 52%. Is that because we just slashed breast cancer in half? Heck no. It's all out there. It's growing. It is not pausing for a pandemic. And plants are the way to get after that disease. And screening. So women, don't delay. Put on a mask and get that mammogram, please. Okay. All right. That's wonderful. So we're going to start out today talking a little bit about the, the, uh, the Pink Lotus Breast Center in, located in Beverly Hills, California. And um, I'm going to put some uh, banners on so people can see all the great things that you are doing at, um, at, at, at your breast center, because it's not just a place where you see patients. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do and how your breast center is different from other, other um, doctor's offices? Absolutely. I'd love to. So, you know, the brick and mortar Pink Lotus Breast Center, it's in Beverly Hills and you're welcome to come see me. We do telemedicine. I've got tons of um, ways to diagnose and treat breast cancer, but also just lumps and bumps and breast pain. I see a lot, all benign disease too. The real thing I realized over the 20 plus years that I've been a breast cancer surgeon is that women really want to be informed about their options and their choices. They want to be educated and they want to participate and above all else in, in life, true of their breast health and control over their own health, but just of their entire lives, they want to feel significant. They want love and support and meaning. And I'll tell you, there was a study called LACE, Life After Cancer Epidemiology Study, where they followed over 2,200 early stage breast cancer thrivers for over 10 years. And what they found is that those with low levels of social support from friends and family or lack of religious and social participation were 58% more likely to have died during the study period than those with high levels of support. This really is mind blowing, I think, because it shows you that the mind-body connection is so real. And when you feel isolated and alone, when you're stressed, depressed, 
uh, you know, exacerbated by these COVID times for sure, but just in life in general, and then you layer on top of that a breast cancer diagnosis, it's a double whammy to your immune system. And it really just sets that stage for inflammation and for all sorts of disease to creep up. So part of Pink Lotus, what I consider the most significant part is actually called Power Up. It's not the breast center. It is an online social community that creates empowerment through community events, podcasts, blogs, crowdfunding, and more. So when you look at Power Up and the six different things that we're offering there, there are these categories. You can show the next slide there and it'll show you first, right front and center, Breast Buddies. This is so powerful. Breast Buddies addresses the 58% increase in mortality that the LACE study was talking about. What is it? It is an online matching system basically where newly diagnosed women can go on and put in their facts. Like I'm 42 years old, a stage one breast cancer mastectomy and broop, like match.com out will come up all of the women matched age for age, stage for stage, treatment for treatment who have been there, done that. And they are there because they want to connect with you. They want to befriend you and provide support and encouragement and insight. Crowd cause is kind of like GoFundMe, but cheaper. Breast list is like Craigslist where you can buy, sell, trade, or give away your gently used scarves, hats, wigs, et cetera. A lot of women are like, I bought this post-op bra and I wore it once and it was 80 bucks. What do I do with it? So breast list is the answer. Pink events, you might just want to announce to the whole group of 10,000 plus women right now in Power Up. Um, looking to grow, so everybody join. Um, pink events, you can just list like your 5K coming up or your Tata the Tata's party. You might be inviting people or you might just be announcing it. Breast groups, it has the basic functionality of Facebook where you would go on, create a profile and you can chit chat. You could be like, yeah, I finished Herceptin 17 today and people could give you a thumbs up and write to you. You can have private chat messages going on in discussion groups, like who hates tamoxifen? And then you talk about hot flashes and all those things. And then cancer kicking is nearest to my heart because it really is my own, um, my own brand where I connect with women directly. So next slide, the summit is coming up in 2021. We've got the virtual summit in April and the in-person, live, God willing, summit at Terranea, October 16, 17 of next year. Uh, Terranea, if you don't know, is a gorgeous, breathtaking oceanfront resort in Palos Verdes, California. And whether it's the virtual or the live summits, we are going to have such a tremendous time deep diving into the soil of your life, rooting around, getting rid of all the weeds and the pesticides and the glyphosate, if you know what I mean. And then we're going to be planting in that fresh soil, 10 critical seeds to blooming the orchard of your life that will yield the most fruitful, bountiful existence possible. So I'm really excited about the upcoming summit. There are other things in Cancer Kicking, like the kitchen, where you can learn all about plant-based uh, eating, tons of recipes and how-tos. It's coming soon, but we've got a few um, placeholders there that will excite you, like my Cancer Kicking smoothie that um, has been making the rounds for about eight years now. People have been drinking that thing down and getting optimal health. So I, gotta, a lot of I, make, I make that smoothie. I love that smoothie. I'm going to put the link to it um, in the description uh, later. So after the show, so everybody can look for, uh, look for the smoothie. But I got to tell you, I make this smoothie probably every other day. And I just think it's incredible. So I encourage you. It really everybody. does it have such a punch. I've been adding to it since 2012. Mm. Whenever there's evidence-based um, articles on like a new ingredient that really has these above and beyond anti-cancer properties, boop, into the smoothie it goes. For example, there was a study that came out a few years back looking at over 3,000 foods and measuring the antioxidant oxidant potency of the foods and literally 124 times the antioxidant power of the blueberry was at the tippity top of the list, the Indian gooseberry. And since you can't readily find that in your supermarket, you can get amla, which is the powder form. So boop, in goes a teaspoon of amla into that smoothie. I use it. I get it from Amazon. I get yeah, the organic amla powder. It's easy. It's not very expensive. And I think it's wonderful. Yeah. Great. So, so tell us about, so that's really fantastic. So tell us about, about the store. You have this amazing element store and um, 
I'm going to put the, 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 the link to it up right now. But I think it's just, it's incredible because you have so many things for so many people. You don't have to have breast cancer or be a breast cancer survivor to use the store because you have so many great things for menopause, for people that want to recover from maybe they had a little too much to drink. Tell us a little bit about what, what you have in your store and I'll put the link up. Okay, great. I'd love to. So this is such a thoughtfully designed store. Every single product has been vetted for you. We've done the research and a lot of these supplements actually have randomized controlled trials against placebo behind them. So everything is very um, intelligently and purposefully placed into the store. There's nothing kitschy like ribbon earrings, nothing wrong with those, but we're really about creating solutions to problems that I've been hearing about in my 20 plus years as a doctor. So Pink Lotus Elements has become a leading online women's health and breast cancer store. But as you said, Lisa, you certainly don't need breast cancer to benefit from the uh, things that we offer in this store. So you can shop here, as I said, with peace of mind. Um, and some of the some of my favorites uh, that address product, the products that address real needs before, during, or after a cancer diagnosis include Menopause Miracle, which is a three Asian herb blend that works amazingly against all 12 major symptoms of menopause from hot flashes and um, mood swings, vaginal dryness, decreased libido, itchy skin, thinning hair, you name it, it addresses it. It's, it deserves its name of being a miracle. Primrose Pain Buster for breast pain, multi must have. If you look at the ingredients online at this one and compare it to any multivitamin that you are considering taking, I guarantee you this will blow, blow the other one away. It is so intelligently formulated and very specific to address um, it, the antioxidant, anti-cancer needs of women. It has like six different layers of things in there from, from berries to broccoli sprouts, et cetera, in addition to your basic multi needs. So there's a lot of stuff to explore in there. Um, Cosmo Companion is a really fun one and a bestseller. We, that's for when you are drinking alcohol, it helps negate some of the reasons why alcohol consumption leads to elevated cancer risk for men and women. And then you had put in there, we've got some really uh, fun and important helps for those who are actually going through a breast cancer diagnosis and treatment. So two just examples are the shower shirt that holds you, the drains in place and keeps everything dry while you then get the rest of you clean so you don't feel so gross and icky after a breast surgery. And then for my ladies going through radiation, the new kid on our elements block is topic aloe. It's really amazing. I don't, it's a whole leaf blended aloe with these botanicals that have tremendous anti-inflammatory powers so that you really reduce the redness and the blistering that can occur with radiation. And while it's completely um, focused on the, the patient getting radiation, it's really just for any kind of burn. So not just radiation burn, like sunburn, razor burn. It really is a calming balm for skin anywhere in your body. I love it. And I, I use it. I use it. And it's wonderful for uh, mosquito bites. So oh, that's right. You told me about that. Because yeah, why? Yeah. Right is inflammation and this is anti-inflammatory. Yeah. So yeah, it, it makes works, perfect. It works well. So I love it for mosquito bites. So I'm going to keep it. It's going to be a staple in my in my house for, you know, any kind of bites or flea bites, any of those things. So I'm really, I'm really exciting to have that. All right, so let's move on. Um, some people know that you were the uh, breast cancer surgeon. You took care of um, Angelina Jolie. And um, so let's talk about the kind of cancer that she had. And of course, she's given you permission to discuss that, that, that she was your patient. So we're not, we're not having a HIPAA violation here. But what can you tell our audience a little bit about what, what is a BRCA test? And it's a, I know it has to do with genetics, but maybe you can explain it a little bit for our audience. Yeah, so thankfully, Angelina did not have breast cancer, but she did carry an inherited genetic mutation, which she got from, from her mother, um, that put her at incredibly high risk for getting a breast cancer one day, as well as ovarian cancer. So let's talk about this particular gene called BRCA or BRCA. And basically what it is, is a tumor suppressor gene. So we all have BRCA genes. They are supposed to work. And when they do, they see when DNA goes awry and it swoops in and either fixes it or throws it out. So that particular cell with its DNA that mutated, can't propagate and actually continue to form a cancerous mass that then can metastasize and cause you true harm. When your BRCA is broken, however, 
it doesn't recognize these DNA mutations. And mm, they're like, good luck with that because I can't help you. And what becomes very significant, if you go to the slide with the bars, it shows you the risks for the BRCA. Next slide. It, relative to general population, if you have a BRCA1 mutation, and particularly if you're Ashkenazi Jewish, studies show up to 87% chance of, of breast cancer in your lifetime, 87%, and ovarian cancer up to 44%. So these are sky high numbers that would make even the, um, the most confident woman take, a, take pause over her future risks. And what having a gene eventually does, if you find out, it brings you to a decision, a fork in the road, where you're either going to follow a path of high-risk surveillance, or you're gonna get maximally um, preventive and remove the organs at risk, meaning you have a double mastectomy and remove both ovaries, or you don't have to do both. But the point simply is, if you have this gene mutation, you shouldn't fear it. You should feel empowered by this heads up that a lot of women don't get. They get it in the rear view, they get a breast cancer, then we test them for a mutation and lo and behold, they have one. Had they known that 10, 15, 20 plus years earlier, they could have been more proactive with their surveillance, with their risk reduction strategies through diet, nutrition and lifestyle and or through prophylactic operations. So a lot of people listening are probably wondering, well, what exactly makes you high risk to have a mutation? So let me explain who are the highest risk people, but it's actually become quite affordable. You might just want to test to know. So the red flags for having a possible inherited genetic mutation, BRCA just being one of them, we now routinely test for between 30 and 84 different genes only 11 have to do with breast cancer specifically, but as long as we're doing the panel, we may as well see if you're high risk for any cancers. So now think about your family tree. I want you to remember you are half your dad's DNA. There's this false idea that floats around like, oh, well, that was my dad's sister. So that aunt's cancer doesn't matter. I get the thought that like it's breast. So you think that has to just do with maternal and mom, but it turns out you are half your dad's DNA, as I said, and the breast cancer in his side of the family matters just as much as mom's. So first, second, and third degree generation relatives above you, meaning like your grandmother, great aunt, and below you, like a niece or a grandchild, all right? So you've got your three generations, both sides of your family, and here's the big list. If there are two relatives on one side with breast cancer prior to age 50, or ovarian cancer at any age, you should test. If you are of Ashkenazi descent, you get the Jewish special. You only need one of the above, one relative with breast prior to age 50 or ovarian at any age. Why this? Because the BRCA mutation in particular runs about one in 500 people in the world. If you're of Ashkenazi descent, it's one in 40. And that's before you layer in a little family history. So that's why only one of the above plus Jewish heritage. If you yourself have had breast cancer prior to menopause or a triple negative subtype prior to age 60 or two totally separate breast cancers that occur, you should test. If there are any men in the family tree with breast, with a uh, breast cancer, or anyone with a known genetic mutation that has a direct bloodline to you. Pancreatic cancer is tied to BRCA2 and some other mutations, and it's rare. So if there's a pancreatic plus any ovarian or breast at any ages, boom, you should test. And finally, just a whole lot of cancer going on. So three or more on the same side of the family, breast, ovarian, pancreatic, prostate, colorectal, gastric, uterine, or melanoma. If you make the red flag list, that means that you have a 10% or greater chance of carrying a genetic mutation. And insurance carriers, by and large, I mean, pretty much all of them, including Medicare and Medi-Cal um, or Medicaid across the country, will follow these criteria and cover testing if you meet them. If you do not, however, it used to be prohibitively costly, like literally for $4,500 to get a genetic test. Now, because of competition in the marketplace, and a test can be had. In fact, you, the next slide, the color um, has a 
FDA approved home testing kit that you can get for $239. And this tests for 30 major gene mutations, including all of those that lead to elevated breast cancer risk. So pinklotus.com elements, you can get the color test there. It's mailed to your home. You register it online, spit in a tube, mail it back. And a couple of weeks later, you'll not only have your results, but it comes with a bo uh, board certified genetic counselor appointment through color. So that's, um, that's the thing about genetic mutations. Mm -hmm. Having said that though, what percentage of people have their breast cancers related to an inherited gene mutation such as BRCA? It's only five to 10%. Think about that. The converse number 90 to 95%, no genetic mutation. In fact, 87% of all women with breast cancer do not have a first degree relative with breast cancer. So anybody out there thinking, oh, phew, I'm like so not on that list, I'm off the hook. You are totally hanging on that hook. If you are a human being, especially if you're a woman and you're getting older, <laughs> you are elevating your risk for breast cancer as each decade goes by. The highest risk decade to get breast cancer, by the way, 70 to 80. So you're really, not off the hook ever. So what role does diet play? Food choices? <sighs> diet and nutrition is one of the heavy hitters. So if you think about a scale, right? On that scale are risk factors. And every time you make a choice in life, you're either adding weight to one side of the scale or the other, pushing you toward cancer or away. And there are boulders basically on that scale that matter more than anything else. And the four boulders that push you toward cancer or away are going to be diet and nutrition, alcohol consumption, exercise, and weight. Above and beyond that, hormone replacement therapy, environmental toxicities, emotional stress. These are examples of things that for sure they exist and they're bad or good, depending on, you know, if you're managing your stress or letting it create some sort of cytokine flare in your body, increasing inflammation. So these I would call pebbles though, and maybe even grains of sand. If you've got a boulder, boom, if you're overweight or obese, as are 72% of all Americans, it doesn't really matter about the potential toxicities of BPA, the plastic in a water bottle or the aluminum in your deodorant, because weight it, far and away has such a bigger effect on breast cancer causation, propagation and metastases that I just don't even care about the BPA in plastic. So when you ask about diet and nutrition, it is a boulder. And there are chemicals in food, phytochemicals, plant-based chemicals, which sounds disgusting. So we usually call them phytonutrients because the chemicals in plants are nutritious. They fight for you. They decrease estrogen levels. Estrogen feeds and fuels 80% of all breast cancers. And most, and many, I should say, plant foods have anti-estrogens in them. They will lower the, the cancer fuel estrogen in your body. And chief among those are going to be soy and cruciferous vegetables and flax seeds and button mushrooms and fiber. So those are just some real bold examples. Like those are the big heavy hitters when it comes to decreasing estrogen levels. What else do these phytonutrients do in your body? They decrease growth hormone, in particular IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor. So this is the big daddy of them all that runs around and creates growth, growth of um, your own cells, which thankfully we need IGF-1 to replace the 50 billion cells a day that we're turning over, but in excess, what's it doing all day? IGF-1, it's screaming at things to grow, grow atherosclerotic plaque, grow a cancer cell, grow that cell into a mass, grow that cell into a metastases, into lung or liver or bone. So the only thing that elevates IGF-1 above and beyond what your daily needs are for cell turnover and muscle repair and brain protection is animal protein and animal fat. So plants combat the elevation in IGF-1. Plant chemicals combat inflammation, free radical formation, oxidative stress, and importantly, angiogenesis. Angio blood vessel genesis birth, the birth of new blood flow. Every cancer cell beyond the size of the tip of a pencil requires blood flow 
its own personal supply in order to continue to multiply, divide, grow, and eventually, boom, exit strategy straight out from that same blood vessel into lung, liver, brain, or bone. So foods are anti-angiogenic. They take away those pipelines, the blood supply bringing nutrients to that cancer cell. And a cancer the size of a pen point is never gonna kill you. So if you get its blood supply taken away right when it needs it to continue to exist inside of you, boom, it doesn't exist anymore. Your immune system identifies and destroys that little pinpoint. So what are the 10 breast superfoods? These are the foods that I've identified through my extensive research into nutrition and foods effects on the things that breast cells in particular need to thrive inside of you. Um, these have anti everything, anti estrogen, anti inflammation, anti growth hormone, anti angiogenesis. And that is why these make the top breast superfoods list plus soy, which is its own little section for me. So number one, cruciferous veggies and leafy greens. I've got here written down for you just the chemical names that you know I can impress you that I can say them without stuttering like isothiocyanate or sulforaphane or indole-3-carbonyl. But basically I just want you to understand that these are real chemicals that are inside our foods. You just chew and swallow. You don't have to understand what they're doing or how to pronounce them. Just know they are getting absorbed into your bloodstream coursing through your veins, saturating your cells and working for you. Every time you chew and swallow a, just a broccoli floret or some arugula, kale, collard greens, mustard greens, you name it, but cruciferous veggies and le leafy greens top the charts when it comes to um, fighting, seeking and destroying cancer cells. How many so, servings a day should people have? Like, should they have it once a week? Should they have it every day? How do you, how do you, what, what is your recommendation in terms of how much and how often? So two to three servings of simply that one category of cruciferous veggies and leafy greens. You can get two servings easily and two fistfuls of leafy greens pushed into the smoothie that we talked about already. So it really is not as difficult to consume these foods as one might think when you start to learn how to creatively combine them into meals that all work together for you. Well, these are you know incredible flavor components. So th this is what makes food taste good. And, exactly. Uh, yeah, and 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 you have turmeric and spices. You have curcumin and piperine. Piperine, I think, is black pepper. Yes, it is. So piperine, uh, as as standalone, actually has anti-cancer properties. But what it does is it potentiates the activity, the bioavailability of the curcumin and turmeric by up to two thousand percent more bioavailable. And curcumin and the other anti-cancer properties of turmeric. By the way, there was a study that put turmeric and curcumin head to head in breast cancer in Petri dishes and turmeric had more cancer kill properties than the curcumin alone. So a lot of people appropriately, correctly identify curcumin as the big daddy actor inside turmeric, but it doesn't act alone. It has synergistic properties with the rest of turmeric that science hasn't really like figured out yet. So when you get your curcumin pill as like a supplement, uh, uh, you should have just sprinkled that turmeric onto your salad or into your um, beans or rice or something because you get more power that way. Plus the piperine to make it more bioavailable. Plus this is a fat soluble uh, phytonutrient. So you want to combine it with a healthy source of fats. In my smoothie, the fat is flax seeds, but on a salad, it might be avocado or a whole olive, for example. So mm -hmm. that that's one thing um, to remember when you're having your turmeric. We need some Piperine from pepper, black pepper, and we need some fat. Other things on the superfood list, berries, the the uh, poly the polyphenols and anthocyanidins in uh, in berries are just off the charts. And something interesting is that frozen berries actually deliver that polyphenol power much more readily than fresh. So that's great to know because berries aren't often in season and they're actually cheaper to get in the organic frozen uh, bags than, than fresh. And they actually deliver all that power more readily. So I, every day, not every day. Okay, so like th three to four days a week, I have that smoothie. And the days that I don't, you can get this recipe, although it's super easy to, I just tell it to you, but cancer kicking um, in the kitchen. I've got a few recipes up there and one of them is called Holy Oats because I learned that when you don't cook, your, you know who taught me this? I actually was doing a uh, conference 
at Jane Esselstyn's uh, house. So I went, flew to Cleveland, Ohio, and I stayed with Dr. Esselstyn, who, God bless him, had a terrible flu at the time and was in his bedroom most of the time I was there. But he um, he taught me that he never cooks his oatmeal and he has it every single day for breakfast without fail. He just puts oats and um, some plant-based milk and a bunch of berries. I put flaxseed and cinnamon and I do not cook it. And the reason why is it creates a resistant starch that resists Ooh. digestion uh, through the small intestine and ends up being such a powerful prebiotic for your microbiome and your colon. And then those little bacteria in your colon munch on the whole oats and release a whole bunch of antioxidant, antioxidants and vitamins and um, uh, short chain fatty acids and create a world of health that you inadvertently destroy by cooking. So okay. all we do uh, old fashioned oats or, or um, steel, steel cut. cut. Yeah. So don't do the cut. instant ever uh, or the uh, quick cooking. They're yeah. cut too thin. You get sugar molecules created way too quickly in your small intestine and absorbed, you get a sugar spike, insulin spike. So those two types of oats are not to be consumed. I want you having either old fashioned or the steel cut. Okay. Just let's, let's talk a little bit about fiber and the relationship between fiber and estrogen. All right, let's do it. So fiber um, suppresses cancer growth because it binds estrogen in your GI tract and it makes you poop it out. And it also improves insulin sensitivity. And just as I was saying, with the prebiotic to the to the uh, flora in your microbiome, it releases antioxidant vitamins and anti-cancer compounds, including lignans, which is a really potent anti-estrogen. In fact, the most concentrated plant source of lignans on planet Earth, flax seeds. Also, the most concentrated source of the healthy monounsaturated omega-3 fatty acids, flax seeds. Hence, two tablespoons of ground flax seeds every single day. Um, I put it in a smoothie. If I don't have my smoothie, it's in the oats. And if it's uh, not in the oats, sometimes I just top it on a salad, but because I'm always eating one of those three things every single day. So, so do fiber, you um, I was go ahead. Ask, do you grind them or do you buy it ground? The flax seeds. I, I buy it ground and keep it in the refrigerator. It will stay fresh and active for three months. But honestly, we literally, because there's five of us in this house eating yeah. flax every day, uh, we go through a bag in two weeks. So I don't need to even bother with whole. But if you buy it whole, uh, you can't consume it that way. You will simply poop it out. Your body can't digest the whole of, of intact flaxseed. So the ways to grind it, if you have a Vitamix or other powerful blender, that'll grind it up just fine, no problem. Or I have a dedicated coffee grinder. I got one for the coffee beans, but one for um, spices. So when you buy whole spices that need to be ground, including the flax, you could just put it in there and it'll grind it right up but you have to consume it ground. Uh, so fiber, people, shockingly, 97%, let that sink in, 97% of human beings do not reach the measly uh, baseline recommendation of 30 grams of fiber a day. And I call that measly because I'm getting at least 60 a day. How do you get your fiber? Here's a tidy little list of some basic ones. One cup of black beans, lentils, or split peas will give you 15 grams. You're already halfway there. Now, granted, a lot of people like one cup, I would just fart my way home, like straight through the sky if I ate that many beans. So it is true that a lot of fiber rich foods also are very gaseous. So they're going to create um, gas, but we, we're going to talk about that in a minute and how to limit some of the gas um, creation inside of you. But avocados, a, a medium sized avocado will have 13 grams of fiber, one cup of berries, eight grams, that's raspberries. Other berries uh, tend to have more like five or six grams. Pearled barley, one cup, six grams. Broccoli, one cup, five grams. So if you are able to consume 30 grams of fiber a day, you drop breast cancer incidence by 50%. But even just getting 15 grams will drop it by 20%. So fiber is a very powerful anti-cancer, anti-breast cancer food source. And if you're having problems with gas because of the fiber, there are a couple of ideas I have for you. First of all, start small. If you're, especially if you're new to plant-based eating, do one or two tablespoons of beans a day, do that for a week or two, and then boom, add another tablespoon, and then eventually get yourself up to a cup. The longest lived populations on planet Earth, you may know them as blue zones. Each one of those five blue zones 
in com- has in common beans as a food that they eat on a daily basis, on average a half a cup or more a day. Each society has a different bean of choice, but they're all big bean eaters. So that if you want to live long and prosperous, you want to eat beans. So start small, build yourself up so that your microbiome changes. And as the flora there change, they're changing toward a microbiome that is better able to digest the fiber found in beans and other foods. The other thing is that, okay, this is funny. When I was in residency, surgical residency, and I did my GI surgery stuff, I remember hearing all the time that 80% of gas of farts is from swallowed air. I mean, how'd you like to be the scientist doing that study, studying (laughs) farts? Um, But I actually then read the studies and it's true. And I, I kind of didn't understand it for the longest time because I just thought they can't be, you know, like that you swallow that much air when you're talking. But really, then it occurred to me because I eat fast um, and most people eat fast. How many chews, honestly, do most people give their food before they swallow it down and stick another fork full into their mouths? It might be like five or six. So particularly if you're eating something like a salad, right, you got all this lettuce and a couple of veggies in there and then you put the whole thing in your mouth two, five times and swallow you're swallowing down a bunch of air because it's all in between each of those constituents in your salad. So focus on eating, eat mindfully. It's good for a number of reasons, but particularly if you're focused on gas, you want to be chewing your food to a puree and then swallowing it down. And then all those little micro bubbles of air, they're actually escaping through your mouth and, and you're swallowing down just pure, a pure food bolus and swallowing less air. So that's, Tip number two to decreasing um, gas. And the other thing is just to accept it. Like gas is part of part of uh, being a big plant-based eater, but it does get less. People stick with it. I would say at the six to nine month mark, you will notice you will notice much less gas. Now, another uh, fiber for people who are worried they're not getting their 30 grams or they want to exceed it, but they're just not eating enough fiber. There are supplements. Bellway is my favorite. You can get it at Pink Lotus Elements. It's my favorite because it's completely devoid of all those like food colorings and contaminants that are in your basic ones. It's the first time fiber has really been reformulated in the last 25 years uh, is through this Bellway supplement, which has all natural ingredients and some great flavors. It's insoluble fiber. It doesn't increase gas, but it does increase stool bulk and it's going to get rid of carcinogens that are in your stool. So basically, if you have slow stool transit time, you're getting an increased absorption of bile salts into your body. Bile salts are meant to be excreted. And when you test the blood of women newly diagnosed with breast cancer, they have 50% higher levels of bile salts than women without breast cancer. So believe it or not, constipation leads to increased breast cancer. In fact, the study looked at about 2000 women with breast cancer and examined their bowel habits against placebo. And it turns out that if you have two or fewer bowel movements a week, you have four times the breast cancer risk as a woman who has one or more bowel movements a day. So those who eat plant strong, poop strong. Plant strong? (laughs) (laughs) strong poop strong it's true it's true and you know i've had actually clients say to me i've been going to the bathroom twice a day like is that normal and i go yes (laughs) right not if it's runny stool but yeah if you've got a solid movement yeah you're like the envy of many right sausages (laughs) yeah we don't want to eat them we want to put them plant-based the plant-based ones (laughs) right but it's it's true, and 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 I you know I, I can tell you that personally on a personal note that when I became vegan back in two thousand uh, beginning of two thousand nine, all of that changed, everything changed, and I could never see myself going back. My my only regret is that I didn't do it earlier, and I think that's everybody's regret because we just don't know. But um, it's really important, so I, I'm, I'm glad that there's a product as well. All right, let's talk about hormones. Lots of women want to know about hormone replacement therapy when they're going through menopause, and they want to know, am I going to get breast cancer if I take HRT? Let's talk about that. Right. So there is a cause and effect here. It's just not a fait accompli, and it requires some thoughtful conversation. So let's let's do a little hormone overview. 
Uh, the vilification of hormone replacement therapy began when JAMA published a very important landmark article in July 2002. This was called the Women's Health Initiative, or WHI. This study, if, next slide, followed 16,000 postmenopausal women with a uterus. That's key because if you have a uterus, you need a progesterone component to your HRT to make sure you don't get uterine cancer. You need to create a little shedding of that uterine lining. Okay, so all the women in the test group had PremPro, which is estrogen plus progesterone versus a placebo. And after 5.2 years, they called it quits for ethical reasons because they found 26% more breast cancer was happening in the prem pro group versus placebo, along with heart attacks, strokes, blood clots, and dementia. But there were, to be fair, fewer colon cancers and hip fractures in that group. This WHI trial ended in 2005, but I wanna bring up two points. Point number one is that, so 2002 it was published. In reaction to that, gynecologists and internists across America, whoop, wit like literally that year 33 million prescriptions for hrt disappeared from america uh so maybe about 3 million women quit using hrt and the following year in just a 12 month time period which is pretty pretty revealing we had an unprecedented 7% drop in breast cancer in 2003 and that drop was found exclusively in postmenopausal women with estrogen driven cancers. So that pretty much pointed the finger again at PremPro and HRT being a culprit. But the study ended in 2005, they continued to follow another 13,000 women uh, and followed the breast cancer incidence. So now the 2010 update showed that that group with PremPro still had elevated breast cancer to the tune of one out of 143 users. So basically that doesn't sound like a lot. Like if you're hot flashing your way to a divorce, you're like, really, I got a one in 143 chance of getting breast cancer? Give me that pill. But next slide, if you extrapolate that to the truth about how many women are on HRT, six million about in America, and that percentage, one out of 143 is 0.007%, of 6 million women, you're talking about just over 41,000 invasive breast cancers every single year in the United States that are totally preventable by not using hormone replacement therapy. But that's just the WHI study, right? There's also the Million Women study that also came out in 2003. This was from the UK. And as it sounds, it followed 1.1 million women. And actually that study found a 66% increase in breast cancer for hormone users versus placebo. However, some people may be aware that if you don't have a uterus and you don't need the progesterone, if you're just on estrogen only, there are additional studies that actually show a protective effect. Um, like actually, uh, it's 20, I think it was a 57% drop in breast cancer. It was really high, but here's the interesting thing that the subset of people who had breast cancer protection from estrogen only use could not use their hormone replacement in the first five years during menopause. That's when you need it the most, when your symptoms are driving you crazy and you could not use it for more than 10 years duration. So there's all these caveats and nuances, but hot off the hormone press, if you look at a big study that came out in the fall of just last year from the UK again, this was a meta-analysis looking at over 100,000 women using all types of hormone replacement for five years of use. Um, uh, so estrogen plus progesterone, one out of 50 users within five years would get a breast cancer. If you use less progesterone and it was intermittent use, it was one in 70 and estrogen alone was one in 200 at five years of use. So you can see here that the progesterone component seems to be more contributory to breast cancer than estrogen alone, but estrogen alone is still not totally innocent. Um, but so, by the way, I, I misspoke and now I'm remembering. So the estrogen only study was a 23% decrease in breast cancer, but after 10 years use, it was a 57, that's where that number came into my head, 57% increase in breast cancer if you used estrogen alone for more than 10 years. So, so basically at the end of the day, it's an individualized discussion. You have to have a conversation with your doctor explaining why you want to be on hormone replacement. Is it simply because you have some early osteo 
osteopenia and you're worried about osteoporosis, your mom had a hip fracture, you never want to go through that pain. Well, we've got other things for bone health. There's bisphosphonates, there are plant-based eating, there's uh, weight-bearing exercises, et cetera. So that is probably not a good standalone reason to be on hormone replacement. If you look at non-estrogenic options for hot flashes, that's the number one complaint of all women for their menopause symptoms and reasons for going on HRT. Hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia are the top three, but you've also got decreased libido and other things. So complementary medicine like acupuncture and Chinese herbs can be very helpful with hot flashes. Herbal remedies, we've got our menopause miracle, Black cohosh, you can't take for more than six months or have liver toxicity, but against placebo, it's like a 50% decrease in hot flashes. So then some other herbal remedies, melatonin, vitamin E. There are also prescription medications, but you know, as everyone knows, prescriptions have their own bag of side effects that might come with them. But nevertheless, if you're miserable enough to try them, there are meds that change nerve impulses and blood flow like ergotamine, clonidine, gabapentin, and also other prescription drugs that block serotonin and norepinephrine. You might recognize these names as being antidepressants, ven venlafaxine, proxetine, which is Prozac. Um, and then there's body movement, biofeedback, focused breathing, exercise, stretching, tai chi, yoga, all of these non-estrogenic options really do work for women, but they have to stick with it. If you if you want something that's just, I already mentioned at the top of our hour, but um, Menopause Miracle, I've scoured the earth for 17 years looking for something phenomenal that would be safe. And I was just beyond delighted to stumble across Menopause Miracle, which is simply a three Asian herb blend. There's nothing more in there. And it's been well studied, three randomized controlled trials against placebo with blood drops showing that there's no increase in estrogen. It's safe for breast cancer patients to take. It does not interfere with cytochrome P450, which is the liver enzyme that's responsible for activating medications like tamoxifen. And people get relief. And it's not just for hot flashes. It's all 12 major symptoms. And then in these randomized studies, they found out just incidentally, that it improved cholesterol levels. So HDL up, LDL down and increased bone density. So consider this, um, as with most herbs, it can take like a month, 30 days of taking it every single day. And then boom, one day you just wake up, you're like, oh, the hot flashes are all gone. So that I just um, encourage women to have a conversation before you leap to HRT, which is oftentimes so much easier for doctors to just write a script, right? And they make you happy. And if you get breast yeah. cancer, the numbers are, it's not like the breast cancer has a little tag on it that said, I'm from HRT and you can blame your doctor or, you know what I mean? Like they're kind of off the hook. They get most people's symptoms under control. And if someone at high risk for breast cancer gets breast cancer, hmm, you are already high risk. You can't say it's the hormones, right? Like that, that's why I think it really requires a thoughtful doctor and conversation and an exploration of alternatives before you leap to something that we know is linked to even more than just breast cancer, as I mentioned. Now, what about Asian women? Now, you know, I know that in Japan, they don't even have a word for hot flash. What, what's your understanding of, of, of that? Because is it, is it, do you think it's their diet? What is your personal understanding of what you think is going on there? Oh, I think it's definitely a couple of things, particularly the soy intake. So Asian women tend to have um, to tofu, edamame, and soybeans in quantities that exceed those of Americans. And soy is a very wonderful and powerful anti um, anti estrogen in some parts of your body, but a pro estrogen in other parts. And where it's pro estrogenic is not with breast cancer formation, uh, but it is a pro estrogen on the things that will control hot flashes and vaginal dryness and such. So I think it's soy consumption. I think it's also body mass index. By and large, Asian women tend to be within an ideal body weight. Excess weight means you have more aromatase. Everywhere you have a fat cell, there's an enzyme called aromatase and it's busy churning away at precursors to estrogen and making them into estrogen. Namely, mm -hmm. testosterone coming from your ovary, even after menopause, your ovary quit making estrogen, it's still spewing out testosterone. And your adrenal gland is putting out, in addition to things you've heard of like epinephrine and cortisol, it pushes out androstenedione and more testosterone. And these precursor steroids get converted to estrogen. The more fat you have, the more aromatase you have. The more fat you have, the more conversion to estrogens you have. It is undeniable and true that overweight and obese women have higher circulating estrogens than normal weight women. And they 
have 50 to 250 percent more breast cancer incidence, recurrence, and mortality from breast cancer simply because of being overweight or obese. And Asian women tend to be ideal body weight, so they have less of the bad actor estrogen flying around to cause their cancers. Very, very interesting. And then if people are consuming or, or are constipated and they're overweight, it's, it, would you say that that's even a double whammy because they're not getting, they're not having the fiber that helps eliminate the estrogen from their body? Yeah, absolutely. And so now, you, you know, we come full circle to how plant-based eating has so yeah. many benefits on multiple levels. So not only is it just an anti-carcinogenic way to eat, but it's a high fiber way to eat when you're eating whole foods and then you're not constipated. So you don't have the enterohepatic circulation absorbing these things entero out of the gut, hepatic filtering it back into the liver and into the bloodstream. Um, and additionally, plant-based eating, it, when you're when you're really eating that way and avoiding the high saturated fats, the ultra processed foods, the refined sugars and cereals and bagels and things like that, yeah. it's hard to be overweight. It's just hard to be a fat whole food plant. There's just, it's, you can't, who wants to eat that much arugula and broccoli to make you actually fat? It's a little hard to do. So it has so many benefits on overall health and weight control, weight maintenance, um, yeah, it's just, yeah. Okay, so here we have Linda Middlesworth. She's a Food for Life instructor and has a large, I think she's got 4,000 people in her in her vegan meetup groups in Sacramento. So hmm. she wants, maybe you can answer the question or just or give her some encouragement here. She says she tells her clients to eat ground flax every day. Are you seeing it on the screen? Every day? Oh, and yeah, I didn't minimize it, so I wasn't seeing it, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, ground flax for sure. Um, so of all, so, okay, again, there's only so many calories you can cons can consume in a day and there's only so many fat calories, even the good monounsaturated omega-3s that you wanna be consuming in a day. So I get asked often this question about like, well, which seed is the best? Like flax seed, hemp seed, chia seed. And the answer is flax seed far and away. And the reason is, although I already mentioned, it's the most concentrated plant food on planet earth with the highest omega-3 fatty acids, which are the healthy good ones, as opposed to omega-6, omega-9, and then of course the polyunsaturated and saturated, which are worse and worse. Um, so it has the best fat uh, makeup, but more importantly, when it pertains to breast cancer, it has lignans pretty much 100 times the lignin content of any plant food on earth. Some plant foods have more like, you know, it has like 50 times the amount, but literally it's usually 100 times the amount. And lignans are anti-estrogens and they create all of that, that fight for you. Because remember, 80% of all breast cancers are fed and fueled by estrogen. A really fun study that will blow your mind a bit. They took... Uh, I forget how many, I want to say it was 50 women with breast cancer. They took their core biopsies and they evaluated something called the KI 67. This is the proliferation rate. It's the, it's the percentage of cells under the microscope that are actively dividing. They also looked at the HER2, H-E-R2 receptor activity, which is a bad actor. If you have a HER2 driven tumor, it is aggressive. You have generally everybody has to do chemotherapy and then a year of Herceptin, which is this missile like drug aimed at it. And thankfully, after you do that year of treatment, chemo and 17 rounds of Herceptin, you have an excellent prognosis. But as a, before Herceptin had been identified, which is about 20 years ago now, um, it had a high mortality rate. Okay, so they looked at the HER2 receptor activity. And um, they looked at the apoptosis rate. This is the percentage of cells that are exploding or in cancer cell suicide mode. Apoptosis is programmed cell death, all right? So we've got those three markers. Everybody got a muffin and they ate a muffin every single day, except half the group had a placebo muffin and half got a flaxseed muffin that amounted to the amount of two tablespoons of ground flax seeds a day, okay? And muffins are junk food, right? They're vegan junk food. So, or or not, depending if they're butter or whatever in there. But the point is they eat muffins, not even like pure flax and health. 
every single day they had their muffin. Then they had their cancer surgery five weeks later. The cancers were then reanalyzed. And listen to this. KI-67, that was the inherent division rate of the cancer cells, had slowed down by 32% in the flaxseed muffin group. The wow. two cell expression on the surface of cells down-regulated by 71%. The apoptosis, the cancer death rate, boop, up 31%. Just from five weeks of eating flax seeds with an existing invasive breast cancer. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't advocate to anyone trying to kill an existing invasive breast cancer with kale. I think it's a good start, but that cancer had such a heads up on you and it's so sinister and so, so brilliant in its ability to sequester all the things it needs. And to, it literally has its own aromatase. The enzyme in the fat cells, it doesn't need you to be fat for itself. It literally has its own aromatase and hijacks the fat in your breast and uses that aromatase. So in other words, it, it's been working behind the scenes to create its little network of everything it needs that for you now to come so late to the game and be like, oh, okay, now I understand and I've learned so much. And so I'm gonna eat kale and I'm gonna have flax seeds. It's a better idea to actually just get rid of all the stem cells and everything about that cancer. Just get it out of your breast and your life and then God forbid if there are some rogue cells flying around your bloodstream and they want to implant in lung or liver, they have a much harder time succeeding because think about it. It's still a breast. It's a deranged breast cell, but now it's in foreign soil. It's in a liver, right? It needs to get its nutrients all over again. It needs growth factors. It needs inflammation and acid. It wants um, angiogenesis. We got to create some blood vessels and it needs its fuel. So for one cell to become two, to become four, to become well, one centimeter detectable mass, that's one billion cells. Aha. If you're working against one rogue cell, even a little pinpoint, remember after a pinpoint, we need blood flow and boom, you're eating anti-angiogenic foods. Now you're talking. Now you are the person who's going to be in the 70%, 75% of women who don't get a breast cancer recurrence. So I encourage women always to, um, you know, be intelligent about your fight against your breast cancer. I think that you can combine, you know, West and East or just complementary strategies with the tried and true like surgery and sometimes chemo and radiation and anti-estrogen prescription medications. Well, you know, this is your one shot, your one shot in life. And if you already have an invasive breast cancer, maybe you want to just bring, uh, you know, every ammunition in the tank and throw it at, throw it at that cancer. So what do we want to say to Amira St. John? She says, I don't trust mammograms. What's your opinion of mammograms? And I know we're going to talk about tomosynthesis as well, but let's, let's, let's Ter talk. Terrific. Terrific question and an accurate one um, in that like your mistrust of them is um, not unfounded. So there's two reasons to distrust mammograms, but neither is a reason to not get one. But let's talk about it. So first fear for women is that there's radiation in a mammogram and therefore can't mammograms actually cause breast cancer? The answer is yes. If you take 10,000 women and you give them a mammogram every single year between the ages of 40 and 74, at the end of all of those 34 years of getting mammograms, you will have caused eight breast cancers, eight out of 10,000 women getting annual mammograms for 34 years. However, you will have detected 800 breast cancers. So in other words, mammograms detect a hundred times more breast cancers than they cause. Now, there really should be a way to detect cancer in, that with, with a modality that doesn't actually cause any breast cancer whatsoever. But right now, this is what we got, mammograms. Number two reason um, is that can't, it's not a hundred percent. So you're, you get a clean mammogram, but really your mammogram's ability to see cancer depends in large part on your breast density. So if we show this slide called uh, breast density, um, basically you 
probably think your breasts are dense if they feel lumpy and bumpy to your fingers, but that's not density. Density is a visual interpretation of how much of the white splotchy snowstorm stuff is visible on a mammogram versus the black and light gray, which is fat and stroma and blood vessels and things that don't get breast cancer. So if you look at this slide from your left, level A means that less than 25% of the breast tissue is dense. That is a predominantly fatty breast. Next level B, between 25 and 50% of the breast tissue looks white and splotchy. Level C is going to be 50 to 75%, and it's a visual interpretation, as I said. And level D is 75 to 100%, extremely dense. So when you compare level D to level A, the level D has five times the breast cancer risk as a level A. Thankfully, those are only 10% each. So 10% of women have a fatty level A breast, 10% have a very dense level D. That makes 80% of women in the big fat bell curve of B and C. So just because you're level C dense, which is 40% of women, you don't have five times the breast cancer risk. That's just the D versus the A, right? The highest quartile to the lowest. Um, but I want to point out that cancer always looks white on a mammogram. So great. Now, if you have dense breast tissues, you're looking for a snowball in a snowstorm. Mm -hmm. So it, it, one reason people don't like mammograms is that it can miss cancers. And absolutely it can between, depends how dense your breasts are, but up to 50% of breast cancers in the densest breasts are missed. So one workaround for that is 3D tomosynthesis. This might be available in your area. Sometimes there's an extra charge. It can be like 300 bucks extra in order to get a 3D mammogram. But if you look at this, you'll see that there's slices, 14, 18, 22. What does that mean? From your perspective, it's still your breast in between two mammogram plates with squishing pressure. Sorry about that, ladies. And yes, radiation. In fact, a touch more radiation than your typical 2D digital mammogram. But with a 2D, you just squash the breast and then I get a picture. Uh, and it's like, okay, if you think of your breast like a loaf of raisin bread, who doesn't? Okay, you squash that, choop, take a picture and show it to me and say, find the raisins. That's a 2D mammogram. When you get 3D, again, same from your perspective, boop, breast got squished. But what I see is 15 to 30 slices of that breast tissue. And now, boom, the raisins pop out. How much better? Big study called STORM showed that 3D versus 2D mammogram found 34% more breast cancers, and that was usually in the dense breasted breasts because it pops out better in the fatty ones, and 17% fewer callbacks for false positives, which is when they go like, oh, we think we see something, come on back. And so more radiation with more views, maybe an ultrasound, maybe a biopsy, only to find out, oh, thankfully it's nothing. It's benign. It's, you know, a cyst or something, but you're like, really? Because I just went through all that anxiety. I already wrote my will. I figured I had breast cancer and was going to die. And I had to take time off work and I had to find someone to take care of my kids. Like it has its downstream cost. All right. So cost is not always money. And that is why you hear different societies coming up with different recommendations. They've done their cost benefit analysis of mammography and they've decided that you should start at age 40. No, they say start at age 50, get it every single year. No, they say do it every other year. You shouldn't stop until you think you're gonna die in the next five to 10 years. No, you should stop when you're 74 years old. Oh, like literally reputable, well-researched, thoughtful groups have come up with these wildly different recommendations for mammography, when to start, when to stop, how often to get it. And the reason is that these recommendations are usually from a committee of people who are like epidemiologists and others that look at the cost benefit. And like I said, the cost isn't always money, it's all the other things, the anxiety that's produced from false positive. And they basically come up with a rather subjective idea of how many mammograms is it worth it to save one life? How many, how many mammograms should you have to do to save one life, to make all the false positives and the callbacks and the unnecessary biopsies worth it? Well, a study was done that asked women that, and they came up with the number of 5,000. 5,000 mammograms is worth saving one life. And the, the US um, task force, when they came up with their thing, they found in the 
in their 40s, it was, took 1,900 mammograms to save one life. But when you hit 50, it took 1,300 mammograms. And that's the number they settled on. So it became, hey, start mammograms at age 50, not 40. If you ask a woman, like, you know, do you think it's worth 1,900 mammogram, negative mammograms to save the one life? They already did this study. Women on the street basically are like, uh, yes. So what I advise people is simply to do whatever you want. It's your breast. It's your life. However, I side with the American Society of Breast Surgeons. And what we say is to begin for normal risk women, begin mammography at age 40 and don't stop or skip years until you think you're going to die in the next 10 years. So that's a little hard to predict, of course, but we're not talking about getting hit by a bus. If you have end stage cardiac disease and you're on oxygen, you can probably stop getting your mammograms because even if you had a breast cancer, that by the time it metastasized and actually caused your demise, your heart disease would, would get you first. And that bears out in the statistics. Women are 26, per, 26 times more likely to have heart disease and seven times more likely to die from cardiovascular disease, meaning heart attack, stroke, than they are from breast cancer. So you have to be smart about your own health. I do want to touch on some other imaging modalities that go beyond mammogram. So we've got the 3D. What if it's not available? What if you've got to drive like 75 miles to get to a 3D? What if um, you have to pay 300 buckaroos and you don't have it or want to spend it on that? But your insurance covers the 2D. I've got good news for you. If you um, combine, so there was a study, they took just over 3,000 women with a negative 2D, that's your typical digital, always covered routine screen or mammogram. And these 3,000 women then all had a 3D mammogram and they all had screening ultrasound. And the 3D mammo group, so everybody had a quote unquote negative mammal, right? It was clear from the 2D. The 3D found four cancers for every thousand women, but the ultrasound found seven. So in other words, if you're dense breasted or otherwise higher risk to have cancer through your own personal history of having precursor things like atypia biopsy or your family history is strong or you carry a genetic mutation, insurance should cover screening ultrasound and your 2D. And you actually are ultimately finding more cancers with the 2D plus screening ultrasound than you are with 3D alone. So there's your workaround. Um, if you wanna be like ultra like platinum, it would be 3D and screening ultrasound. And I generally space those two screening modalities by six months. So every six months, you're getting some good imaging look at your breast tissue. On top of that is breast MRI. And I reserve that for very high risk women, uh, typically over 20% lifetime estimated risk of getting breast cancer from a gene mutation or a personal history, et cetera. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my imaging summary. So very briefly, can uh, Tracy Childs has a question. She wants to know if you can talk about DCIS and uh, overdiagnosis. That's an excellent observation. So DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ, is a stage zero cancer. By definition, these are cancer cells, but they're stuck inside an intact milk duct. Therefore, they cannot access lymphatics or bloodstream. They can't spread. So ultimately, if we all had breast cancer, but it hung out in our breast, not causing pain, and we didn't even know about it for our entire lives, uh, who cares? And I'd rather not know about it. Because as soon as you know about it, it's a little hard to be like, eh, maybe I'll just mm, throw flax seeds at it, right? But I wanted to share a few things. This is a really good, so it's a catch-22, because we're always in search of like the a better um, screening modality for finding breast cancer. Find it earlier. But really, do you really want to? I'm going to share some things with you about DCIS. So number one, only one third of DCIS ever progresses beyond the duct to break the wall and become an invasive cancer. And that's the cancer you want to get at. And even then, some invasive cancers are so indolent, they're basically acting like in situ stage zeros that are going to go nowhere forever. So one third invade and two thirds stay put. So I sure wish we could know who's the two thirds staying put and who's the one third invading. Cause now when you diagnose DCIS, you can know. And if it's in the two thirds that stays put, you don't have to do all that stuff. And that stuff is surgery, sometimes radiation, sometimes anti-estrogen therapy for five or 10 years. And sometimes that surgery in certain individuals is a bilateral mastectomy all over something that would have been nothing. But sadly, this has been extraordinarily well studied. 
They looked at DCIS high grade versus low grade, estrogen driven versus estrogen negative, doesn't care about estrogen, your age over 50 or under 50, the span of DCIS, three centimeters or less, five centimeters or less, and who invades and who doesn't, it's all the same. It's all the same. There's no predictor. Even genomics in the last 10 years has come onto the scene and it doesn't predict who invades and who doesn't. So there's absolutely a problem of the overdiagnosis and overtreatment of go nowhere DCIS, but we can't figure out, figure out which third is going somewhere. There's actually a fascinating study, a cadaver study of looking at 854 breasts of women who died from something uh, like a car accident and they never were diagnosed with an actual breast cancer in their lifetimes. Check this out. This is this will blow your mind. So 854 breasts in those who are 40 to 50 years old, they found that 39% of the breasts had DCIS. But get this, 50 to 70 years old, 10% had DCIS. Huh? I mean, that is a strong suggestion that DCIS regresses and up to 75% of it disappears out of your breast. So what's happening in that crossover is menopause, right? So you withdraw the estrogen influence and suddenly DCIS starts to disappear in 75% of breasts. That also is an argument toward, wow, I'd rather not know about DCIS, particularly prior to age 50, because it might not, it might not only be inert forever, it might disappear. There's another study, albeit in Petri dishes, uh, that looked at, um, basically retinol, you know, from like vi vitamin A. Um, and it was all, all trans retinoic acid, A-T-R-A. And um, it took Petri dishes, normal breast cells, atypical, ones, just a little more from normal, DCIS and invasive cancer. And then they dripped the ATRA, the retinol that your vitamin A on the Petri dishes. And within a couple of weeks, both the atypia and the DCIS reverted to normal, but the invasive didn't get touched. So in a, this also reiterates the problem like DCIS might be reversible and stay inert, but it also reinforces my stance of like, look, you've got an invasive cancer. Let's, let's treat it like an invasive cancer and not think that vitamin A is going to reverse it because it doesn't, it, you know, it's just been around too long. Um, so I, I just worry about people who, who try completely complementary and alternative routes to treating their invasive cancer. I have a, yeah. I have a lot of patients who wow. do that because they know I'm open-minded and they know I'm not going to criticize them or kick them to the curb and be like, you're not doing what, you know, it's my way or the highway. I'm like, all right, try your stuff. Come back in four weeks. Let's measure it again. Let's keep the conversation open. Um, but I've never seen it work on an invasive cancer. I just haven't. Well, that's good information. All right. When I when I wrote the description for the show today, I wrote about uh, I wrote about Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and their new campaign called Let's Let's Beat Breast Cancer. And you are the figurehead for um, for Physicians Committee in the Let's Be Beat Breast Cancer campaign. Let's talk a little bit about that. Let's. I love it. Let's beat breast cancer. So I have teamed up, as you say, with PCRM, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, and this awesome campaign. We reached 6 million women last year, and our goal is 10 million plus for this year. It is such a fun campaign. It is so fun because we have t-shirts. Let's beat <laughs> breast cancer. And what is on the back of me is a four-pronged approach to beating. I don't know if you actually saw that, but on my back is now on this slide here, let's be breast cancer. The four pronged approach is to eat a plant-based diet, to exercise regularly, to limit or eliminate alcohol and to maintain a healthy body mass index or body weight. So what we encourage women to do is to take the pledge and the pledge is simply, I do hereby solemnly swear to do my best to adhere to these four principles to maximally reduce my risk of breast cancer. And um, when you take that pledge, you automatically get a free e-cookbook of plant-based recipes and you automatically, next slide, get entered to win a grand prize pack. So these are available through October 31st. We're running this giveaway campaign as part of the campaign. Super fun. In there, you're going to get um, a, a Vitamix for the grand prize pack. There's our Pink Lotus Elements Multi uh, Must Have, which is that super intelligent multivitamin we talked about. 
and a whole host of other fun goodies in the, you know, some tofurkey and some Mary's Gone Crackers. But basically what we want women to do is to take this pledge. You can post about it, hashtag let's beat breast cancer, hashtag PCRM, hashtag, um, or at tag at Dr. Christy Funk, but make it a fun campaign to invite your friends and family to join because it it becomes a big community. And you also get a newsletter weekly that addresses each of the four prongs. So the first one's all about how to eat more plant-based with tons of tips and tricks. The next one's going to be about alcohol. The third one about exercise and the fourth one about weight control. So we give you practical advice and then um, supportive groups to continue the conversation and the efforts throughout the year. Turns out you have breasts every day of the year, not just in October, but we run the campaign in October. So I'm super excited about it. It was a wild success. We've got fun celebs behind it. Um, John Stewart and his wife, James Cameron, his wife, Alec Baldwin, Ted Danson, Mary Steenburgen. It's just like a huge fun group of people. Wow. And um, I'm honored to be a big part of it. And now it's it's happening at a time now, uh, just a few days ago, this is the 25th, on September 22nd, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine filed a lawsuit against the Food and Drug Administration. It's on their website, so it's common knowledge. And uh, they it, it, it goes back to what happened 180 days ago. So let's just backtrack. So 180 days ago, uh, Physicians Committee asked the Food and Drug they, to, the Food and Drug Committee, to, uh, Food and Drug, the FDA, to uh, sign a petition because they were petitioning to get breast cancer warning labels placed on food that breast cancer may cause uh, that uh, cheese may cause breast cancer. So they're not saying definitively, but they're saying that it may cause that. And kind of like we have warning labels on cigarettes, this is to place warning labels on cheese. Well, the FDA didn't do anything about it. And Physicians Committee kept sending them more documentation and little nudges to, to get them to respond. And the 180 days passed. And then on September 22nd, they filed a lawsuit. So we're going to see more of that. And I think it's very interesting that it's happening at this time when you're doing the Let's Be Breast Cancer campaign. And Dotsy Bausch, who is a, 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 a vegan Olympian, she won the silver medal in cycling in 2012. Uh, almost, she was almost 40 years old and she competed against women who were about half her age, basically young enough to be her daughters. And she scored, one, a silver medal. So in her retirement from cycling, she started an organization called Switch for Good, which I know you know about. And mm -hmm. uh, they have been trying to get the United States Department of Agriculture every five years. They come out with guidelines, dietary guidelines. So they're trying very hard to have dairy as a category removed from the guidelines because the guidelines dictate how federal money is spent. So Switch for Good has um, put together a 48 page report I sent you the report um, and I'm going to post the link. It's in the description. So the link is already posted in the, de in the description for Facebook and YouTube. It's not on Twitter, but I'll see if I can add it to Twitter. And, um, and it's to just basically bring to light the science, the evidence-based science about dairy products. Tell me what you think about dairy products. And, and, and if, you, if you had a chance to look over this long report, um, I'm very interested in hearing your comments. Yeah, dairy is surprisingly um, dangerous for breasts, but it's surprising because we also hear good things. So if you think about what's in the balance of milk, research shows increases and decreases and null effects of dairy consumption on breast cancer risk. So naturally, when you do a meta-analysis combining tons of studies, it's going to conclude that dairy is fine. And if you look at the left side of this slide, um, you would think, I think anyway, that the hormones, the insulin-like growth factor, which we've talked about as a bad actor promoting breast cancer growth and um, metastases, the presence of fat, pesticide residues, antibiotics, aflatoxins, all of these negative effects should overcome the quote unquote healthy and protective effects of calcium, vitamin D, butyrate, lactoferrin, conjugated linoleic acid. Um, but, because, but somehow in the balance of things, it makes these studies look like milk's an innocent bystander and safe to consume. Uh, not so, my friends. So if we look at the LACE study, you might recognize that acronym as part of the study that talked about the psychosocial support when we at the beginning of this hour. 
But they also had a subset of patients, uh, about 1,900 early stage breast cancers. These were followed 11.8 years. And what they found was that high fat, not low fat, but high fat dairy, so now we're talking butter and cheese, with one or more daily servings versus a half or less daily serving, had a 49% bump in all-cause mortality. So uh, it's the prior slide that we're talking about, actually, at least. Um, yeah, so there's a almost 50% increase in death from high fat versus less high fat consumption. And that's another asterisk I would like to point out. These aren't high fat, it's high fat versus low fat dairy, 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 dairy. Like, seriously, what about versus the vegan? What about someone who's not consuming any? Because if it's already a 50% bump, it should be worse if it's uh, cow dairy versus soy milk, right? So here's a really cool study that just came out a few months ago. And this one looked at dairy and soy and the risk of breast cancer. And it looked at a bunch of women, 52,000 North American women followed 7.9 years. And in that time, just over a thousand breast cancers developed. Well, who was more likely to have it develop? The highest versus the lowest consumers of dairy milk paralleled the lay study exactly a 50% bump. But then that's again, dairy to dairy. And of course, I why didn't they do the high, the high uh, dairy versus the soy milk? Nope. Instead, they just had median kind of average level, a cup or two of you drink only soy, but you, you drink a cup or two a day of dairy milk. And yet just in this like baseline middle ground, not like really protective excessive, there was a 32% drop in breast cancer for the soy versus dairy milk consumers. So there's absolutely, um, carcinogenic effects. It has to do with elevating the IGF-1 predominantly, but it's also the estrogen content of high fat dairy, like the cheese, because where is milk coming from? It's coming from a cow. And when do you make milk, ladies? Uh, when you just had a baby. Well, you'd think it would be just when a cow birthed a calf, but it turns out they're constantly producing milk. They're dairy cows. They milk make milk always. And when they stop or slow down, they're beheaded. So this is the deal. They're in a high estrogenic state always because they're inseminated short, like within three months of birthing a calf, boom, they're inseminated again and they're pregnant and they continue to make milk throughout pregnancy. And then after they have the calf, they get a couple of months, two, three months to just be making milk. And this is a high estrogenic state. And where is the estrogen? It's in the fat. So your higher fat foods that are coming from dairy are going to be more estrogenic. Possibly this is the connection and the explanation for the mortality bump in these studies that I just reviewed. But yeah, I'm for sure anti-dairy and couldn't support Dotsy anymore. Like I just love what she's doing with Switch for Good and God bless PCRM and all of their important political and um, legal work that they do to fight for a better plate representation from our USDA. So I would like to encourage everyone to um, look at the, the link. The link to this very comprehensive report is in the description on YouTube and on Facebook, uh, not on Twitter because they don't give me a place to put it. But um, you can download the report and Dotsie's goal, and I'm going to discuss this with every show that I do until the end of the year, until the U.S. Dietary Guidelines come to their final conclusion. I want to spend a few minutes like we did today talking about it, asking everyone to download this 48-page paper and to please forward it, get it into the hands of every healthcare provider you know, every physician, every um, uh, uh, every nurse, every advanced practice nurse, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, registered dietitians, health coaches, everybody needs to read this because these are the people that are influencing health decisions. And then the rest of the public needs to read it as well because we will be enlightened. And I think it's really important for everyone to know this is evidence-based. It's not propaganda. It all comes from hard science, which is why you, Dr. Funk, 
made a change partway in your career when you learned about all of this. So the goal right now is to get this information into everybody's hands. So if dairy is not removed from the U.S. Uh, dietary guidelines this year, that it certainly will be in the next five years, because every five years in the 2025 guidelines, every five years, these guidelines are revised and they are subs and, and, and these food industries are subsidized by the federal government to make these foods cheap enough for people to eat because they're really more expensive. So the, the cost is being subsidized for meat, eggs, and dairy. Um, and uh, it doesn't make us healthier. It's hurting our planet. It's causing global warming. It is, um, or I should say, it's attributed to global warming. Some people say anywhere between, between 15 and 51% of greenhouse gases come from animal agriculture. But look at what it's doing to our health. And then you look at what it's doing to the animals. So we really need to pay Preach attention. It, sister. Pardon? Preach it, sister. <laughs> yes, yes. So that's that's my that's my thing. So anyway, thank you so much for joining us. If you would be kind enough, uh, Christy, to look at the, uh, the 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 comments and the questions and respond as you can over the next few days, I think people would really appreciate that. And I encourage anybody if you're interested in seeing Dr. Funk as a patient, she does telemedicine, and. You could also, I mean, if you, if you, I hope you don't need to see her, but if anybody feels like they need to see her, she's available and, um, and you do do some telemedicine and um, I want to thank you for being here again. I hope to have you back again before the cancer kicking summit. There's going to be a virtual summit in April. I believe you don't have the date yet. And then yeah, you have April, April, 2021, the virtual will begin. You can watch it like for 90 days. So it begins oh, in I April. Oh, in April. Okay, wonderful. And then thank you for correcting me on that. And then uh, October, uh, what's the dates in October 2021? 16th. 16th. And that is going to be something that I'm looking forward to going to. I'm not a breast cancer patient or survivor, but I want to go to the conference because I think it's going to be so interesting and uh, for all the reasons that you talked about. So thank you for being here, everybody. Thank you for hanging in. We went a little bit long today, but I think this is just incredibly important information and everybody should have it. So thank you, Dr. Funk, for being with us and thank my audience. And please sh comment and share the, the, the feed so other people will have access to this information. Have a thank good week. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.